And to sort of illustrate the way I interpret how heart rate variability has evolved over the years, I have put together the five stages. And this is based on the prevailing scientific paradigms that existed in each of these stages. And uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to go through all of these five stages. It will probably take three talks overall to go over all of them. Um, but you know, I think as of today, we'll just largely focus on part one, understanding heart rate variability. And um, the stages are first understanding heart rate variability, and then heart rate variability as a marker of autonomic nervous system, then heart rate variability as a marker of body-wide function, heart rate variability within the construct of mind-body interaction, and then finally the heart rate variability itself as a desirable target. So the first stage, understanding heart rate variability, happened in the 1970s and 1980s predominantly, where there was a focus in physiology and uh, development of methods. In my view, the uh, 1970s and 1980s was the golden age of physiology. Uh, about, you know, this occurred about 20 years after Hodgkin and Huxley final layers, their axon signal transduction along, along the squid axons. This was also 20 years after Watson Crick figured out the DNA double helix structure. And uh, there was enough time for development of imaging stains, such as ELISA in 1971, electrophysiology techniques, such as voltage clamps and machines that are, were important for obtaining electrophysiological measures, neurotransmitter blockades, such as atropine and propanolol, and you also have infrastructure for animal studies. So uh, it is only natural that you would see a significant development or advancement of our physiological understanding of our autonomic nervous system around this time. And by this time, by the 1970s, they really had a pretty good understanding of the autonomic nervous system. And they have divided into two divisions. Actually, there are probably three because there's the parasympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, and the third one is the enteric nervous system, which we don't talk about too much here. Um, and during the 1970s and 80s, they've pretty much outlined the various physiological roles that each of these nervous systems play, and also importantly, understood the anatomical pathways uh, that were responsible for the execution and functions of both of these nervous systems. In regards to the heart, we knew that the parasympathetic nerves uh, slows heart rate and the sympathetic nerves increases heart rate. Now, the contracting functions of the heart are coordinated basically through the electrical conduction system as depicted here in blue and purple. The part that sets the pace for the heartbeats is the sinoatrial node or the SA node located in the right atrium and it helps set the rate of the, the heartbeat. The conduction, the electrical conductions, you have essentially pacemaker cells in the SA node, sends electrical signals down the atrium to the AV node, and then down the Purkinje's of His, the His Purkinje cells, and then down the bundles that led to the contractions of the various chambers. And both the parasympathetic and the nervous, uh, sympathetic nervous system acts at the SA nodes and helps set the rate of the heartbeat. And they both have sort of opposing uh, effects. The sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate, which is shown here you know, going up to 200 beats per minute. The vagal system, on the other hand, slows heart rate. And if you had exact uh, cancellation of each other, and if you let the heart beat intrinsically on its own, the intrinsic heart rate is about, uh, about 100 to 110 beats per minute. And since our resting heart rate is around 70 beats per minute, that indicates that the vagal tone is greater than the sympathetic tone at rest. And we knew that actually in the 1970s um, and even as early as the 1950s actually, was because um, they had done some experimentations with transplanted hearts. And you could see here the heart rate over time in a healthy heart, and you can see that their average heart rate is about 71 beats per minute. And then when they transplanted the heart, uh, either in a dog and a human, um, you could see that the heart rate was much higher, about 99 beats per minute, or even higher to 110 beats per minute. And the other thing that you note is that the variability that you see in the heart rate 
disappears in a transplanted heart. And the reason is that case is because the transplanted heart, in, in order to transfer that heart from a donor to the recipient, you need to disconnect all the autonomic nervous connections to that heart. So that includes the parasympathetic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system. And so you lose this variability and you have a significant rise in your heart rate. And this was known um, as early as the 1960s because the first human cardiac transplantation was done by Christian Barner in South Africa in December of 1967. So we knew this way early on. And this is an example of sort of the complexity that you get with heart rate variability. This is RR interval, which is the inverse of heart rate. And you can see the changes in the RR interval with time or with the number of beats. And the average of this graph gives you the resting beat to beat interval. Or in the analogy that I would like to say is sort of like the C level. The fluctuations that you can see around this quote unquote sea levels is the tides and the waves. And this is the, the heart and rate variability that we're talking about. And as early as the 1970s, clearly uh, physiologists uh, were able to identify the important factors that were involved in heart rate variability and even develop a schematic representation. And this is a pretty good representation. And this was a publication in 1973. They've identified sort of the central neural controls, which included the brainstem control centers and peripheral mechanical factors. And they even developed a schematic to help understand how these various factors interacted with each other. And as noted, they identified the important factors, which included the control centers of the autonomic nervous system in the brainstem, the baroreceptors, which were important for maintaining a stable blood pressure, and also the effect of breathing by changing the intrapleural pressures. And so they've clearly developed a, a very good understanding of this in the 1970s. And one of the important parts, uh, sort of physiological contributions to this heart rate variability is respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is the change in your heart rate as you take a breath in and out. And you may notice as you breathe in, your heart rate, which is illustrated here by the gray, increases with in inspiration or inhalation, and it goes down with exhalation. And there are certain sort of time, dynamical time parameters or information about this. The typical time scales is about every three to seven seconds that you take a breath, or about nine to 24 cycles per minute. So this is the respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And then the other important physiological factor in heart rate variability is the barrel reflex. Barrel reflex is a way to control or stabilize blood pressure. And you have essentially these mechanical receptors located in the aorta and the carotid sinus. And then through the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve, you have signals sent to the brainstem. And then this brainstem signals then get sent to the, the autonomic nervous system nuclei, including the parasympathetic and the sympathetic systems. And then they feed back that response. So that affects the SA node and other regions of the heart. The time scale for the bare reflex is a little longer. It's about three to 20 seconds. And it happens to be greatest probably approximately about six cycles per minute or every 10 seconds. And around this time in the 1970s, in order to capture these variability dynamics, physiologists began to create multiple measures. And it's very hard to see sort of this in, in sort of granular detail here, but what's important to note is already by the 1970s, they've established important time domain measures and frequency domain measures. And this is a summation of the multiple heart rate variability measures that are out there in the literature right now. This was in Schaefer in 2017. These are sort of highlighting the most important ones. There are at least 60 to 70 different heart rate variability measures now. Um, and they're categorized into three big buckets. One is heart rate variability by the time domain measures. The second is heart rate variability by frequency domain measures. And the third one is nonlinear measures. And I'm gonna talk about each of these in a little more detail. 
The first one that I want to talk about is the frequency domain. And the way I want to help you understand how this works is to sort of imagine light. So if you take prism and then you shine white light onto it, then the prism actually breaks down the white light into its different components of uh, so spectral light. You have different speed of light uh, secondary to the refraction within the prism. And as a result, it divides the light into its different frequencies. And you could imagine that if you had a photosensor in this wall and you let that photosensor accumulate the amount of light that goes onto that sensor, over time, you will develop an idea of how strong each of these uh, individual components uh, of light are. You could do the same thing with heart rate time series. And we use different techniques and sort of analogous to the prism, you have something called Fourier transform and autoregressive spectrum analysis. There are some others as well. And what these techniques do is that it permits us to identify the spectral power each frequency range. So you can imagine this heart rate variability is composed of multiple signals with different uh, frequencies. And these techniques enables us to sort of divide them and to identify which component is the strongest. And what you see here is you can essentially produce a spectral power. And you can see that the spectral power is divided according to the frequency. Now frequency, the higher it is, that means the faster the cycle. So the higher frequency is on the right here and the lower frequency is on the left. And over time, we've got a pretty good understanding of the various categories of the cycles of the frequencies that are involved in heart rate variability. And we've divided them into several categories. There's high frequency, low frequency, very low frequency, and ultra low frequency. Uh, and then we have an, a ratio of lower frequency versus high, high frequencies. And the, the frequencies that are associated with each of these frequency ranges are listed here. The ones that I want to have you pay attention to is the high frequency and the low frequency. So high frequency is 0.15 to 0.4 hertz, which is about nine to 24 cycles per minute. Uh, low frequency is three to nine cycles per minute. Very low frequency is 25 seconds to five minutes per cycle, five minutes to 24 hours for the ultra low frequencies per cycle. And in order to evaluate these cycles, you would need to acquire the heart rate over time. And uh, because these cycles are shorter, uh, high frequency, low frequency, oftentimes you just need five minutes in order to get information about these cycles. Whereas for longer cycles, you would definitely need to require as, as long as 24 hours. And each of these cycles have a physiological significance. So high frequency is associated with respiratory sinus rhythmia. The low frequency is associated with bare reflex and vascular sympathetic nerves. Um, and there's something called the Mayer waves, which is the oscillations, the intrinsic oscillations that you see in the vessels. Um, when I'm talking about the artery system. Very low frequencies have slower physiological systems involved, such as temperature regulation, hormones such as renin engine tension, thyroxine, reproductive hormones, and steroids. And then the heart has an intrinsic nervous system as well, which is believed to have a very low frequency range. And then at the ultra low frequency range, it involves thermoregulation, other hormones such as cortisol and growth hormones, and the circadian rhythm. And they knew a lot of this um, as early as the 1970s. And this was a publication in ergonomics. And uh, again, they have created this frequency spectral analysis of heart rate variability. And I'm gonna read this to you because it may be small on your screen, but they have already noticed that the respiratory activity is largely predominantly near 0.35 Hertz, which falls into our high frequency range. The vasomotor activity lies in the 0.1 Hertz, which lies in the low frequency range and thermal activity at 0.025 Hertz, uh, which is in the very low frequency range. So already they knew this in the 1970s.